This is the Infinite Surface Podcast. I'm Jesse Thompson. If you're watching this on YouTube, but would prefer to listen rather than to watch, you can always find an audio-only version by searching the Infinite Surface Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please subscribe. Welcome to episode one of what I hope to be many thoughtful and in-depth conversations about art and aesthetics. I couldn't be happier to kick off this series than by having the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, artistic anatomy. I've invited my friend and fellow artist, Randy Mellick. Randy exemplifies so well the goals of this show. His thoughtfulness and dedication to the subject of drawing, his seemingly unending knowledge of anatomy and its traditions radiate when he discusses the topics. Randy has a genuinely philosophical approach to art and a beautiful and poetic method of description in his art making. I was lucky enough to have Randy as my anatomy teacher when I studied under him at the Lyme Academy. His compassionate style of teaching and analytical eye really made an impression on me in my career, both as a practicing artist and as a teacher. Today, we'll both discuss the paths that we took in studying anatomy. Randy will tell us about his early education and his career as an artist, the root of his focus on anatomy, some of his major influences artistically or otherwise, and his advice to artists who want to study anatomy more seriously. So welcome to the Infinite Surface Podcast, Randy Mellick. Okay, well, welcome, Randy Mellick, to the Infinite Surface Podcast. Well, first of all, I am uh, thrilled and honored to be your first uh, I- interviewee. I, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to get to, get to talk to one of my favorite students of all time. You know, in addition to uh, just sort of flying um, uh, on uh, on your um, drawing pad, you also clearly understood that the challenges in drawing anatomically were, were not merely technical, mm, mm. Uh, but, were, but were artistic. And so here we are these, these years later, um, 10 years later, um, continuing the, the conversation that, uh, mm. that, you, uh, that you sparked um, in, in class. Um, so I'm really quite happy to be here. I, let's see, um, uh, shall I mention a couple of things about sort of how, uh, you know, how, how I got into this, uh, into this line of work. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, and I think everybody would love to hear how it is that you uh, came to where you knew that you were going to be an artist, uh, and then maybe subsequently, how did you get to the point where you knew you were going to pursue something like anatomy? Uh, I didn't think of myself um, as an as an artist or even as an aspiring artist uh, until. Uh, really well after uh, after college mm. um, I, and high in high school I was uh, busy playing drums mm. and uh, any chance I any any chance I could I did um, not know that <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know the, the bands that did covers of uh, all kinds of different uh, mm. you know all kinds of different stuff it was this was the 70s uh, so uh, it's kind of a golden age, but uh, you know everything from uh, from from reggae to big band stuff, um, and in a in a weird way, you know, I think that um, uh, I, I think that uh, being a drummer ha- has sort of a, uh, helped my hatching as a, as a drawer. Mm. <laughs> sure, so from, them, yeah. from drummer to, drummer to drawer is yeah. um, not such a not such a big. A big uh, step, right? right? So hatching is, is rhythmic. Yeah, um, it's all about uh, intervals and uh, you know pressures and um, kind of all in the wrist kind mm. of thing. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe uh, though I wasn't doing anything artistic in high school, I was uh, doing something that tied, uh, you know, that provided kind of a physical basis, mm. uh, created kind of um, manual habits. Perhaps um, yeah. that uh, probably called called upon it. It's not something I've thought very much about. But you you asked what I was doing in high school. Yeah, it's just are you still playing music? That. No, though I have located my drum set, which I <laughs> borrowed uh, or which I lent out to uh, to to my cousin, uh, who mm. lent it out to uh, his cousin on the other side of the on his side of the uh, <laughs> mother's side of the family, which is not my side. 
And uh, apparently it's a, that drum set traveled uh, to Europe and back. And so I have relocated my drum set. (laughs) Oh, long lost friend. I'm going to ask for it back so that I could, so that I can play. Uh, So I, um, uh, you know, then sort of went to college and uh, continued, continued playing, but, uh, but not very much. Um, At that point I was more interested in, you know, kind of running track and Mm. uh, being a, um, uh, a religion major um, mm. in uh, in college. Um, now there, the religion department. You know, you could sort of uh, you could go um, historical or philosophical, uh, Eastern mm. or Western. So I, I went to sort of Western and philosophical. So um, yeah, I've always just been sort of interested in, in big questions. Uh, mm. I had um, a fairly strict, uh, quite strict. Um, religious upbringing and so i mm. uh, got to college and saw that as a chance to um you know sort of um maybe uh, uh, dig a little deeper into the things that i had um been been taught and the things that i had accepted um, pretty much without question mm. um and uh, uh was able to take uh, a lot of um uh, a lot of courses in in, in philosophy Mm. Um, philosophy of religion. I uh, ended up writing a senior thesis on S- Saint Augustine mm. and uh, his relationship to Gnosticism. Uh, the Gnostics were a, a heretical, um, sort of pre-Christian sect running around uh, the Mediterranean world, and um, uh, I, I um, you know, started to become sort of attracted to uh, sort of alternative uh, ways of uh, approaching uh, approaching religious thought. Mm-hmm. And so the, right. and the Gnostics were very marginal, uh, mm-hmm. marginal people and uh, un- unorthodox in their, in their thoughts. And yet St. Augustine, who was all about church orthodoxy, uh, you know, uh, was sympathetic to, to their thinking. So, um, uh, in a weird way, I think that kind of, uh, laid a foundation for the way I approach, uh, mm. approach art. So I'm, I'm interested in, uh, what it is that counts as, uh, orthodoxy, uh, where, you know, the marginal thinkers, uh, kind of, uh, fit into the, the picture mm. and, um, you know, can those, uh, can that marginal thinking, uh, pierce that orthodoxy and, mm. uh, and enliven it? Right. So that it was kind of an intellectual foundation uh, mm. that was was being laid, um, you know, when I was in, in, in college. Um, it, um, now, after freshman year, I took uh, a, a course over the summer. So I was, I guess, 19 um, at what was then the New York Drawing Society. Mm. It was uh, the precursor to the New York Academy of Art. Okay. So this mm. would have been 19, so 1980 or 1979. Right. It was a long time ago. Um, and uh, um, they uh, were running cast drawing courses in the attic of the Dr. Norman Vincent Peel Collegiate Church in St. Mark's Square um, in, the, uh, in the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, so I... You know, drove uh, <laughs> drove my uncle's uh, car uh, um, at night uh, uh, out, out into the city and um, uh, drew the uh, bus of Roma uh, and spent a summer with uh, my first teacher uh, Milay Andreevich. Milay Andreevich uh, is now deceased, um, mm-hmm. but uh, he um, was one of the first artists uh, that Leo Castelli uh, retained. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leo Castelli, of course, is you know hugely impactful um, because of uh, the uh, artists such as I think Roy Lichtenstein, mm-hmm. if I'm um, if I'm not in- incorrect. Um, and in sort of pioneering some uh, American modernists, but right, uh, right. Millet was part of part of that group. But he, he was not a modernist. Mm, um, right. He was uh, was a student in Paris in the twenties and thirties, and being mm. sort of uh, uh, reoriented toward a Puvis de Chavon type um, kind of classicism. Mm. So uh, Malay, uh, at some point during that summer, said, you know, 
you, yeah, you, you're pretty, you know, you're, you're okay with this. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you should think about doing this. Yeah. Oh, I have, I actually have the drawing I made that summer. You, you have it there. It's right here. It, yeah, it's right here. Shall I get it? <laughs> yeah, let's see it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> this is your cast right, drawing. So yeah. It's a cast drawing, right. And uh, I, I, this was not pre-planned. I mean, I just happened to have this. <laughs> that is auspicious. I, ha- I happened to have this uh, nearby. I was unpacking some things. <laughs> so uh so i was i guess 19 when i drew that yeah. and uh, what you know what moved me to take that course um was a, a poster for the new york drawing society and i just remember being attracted to the attracted to the uh the uh artwork it was um i think it was a delacroix one of his student mm. uh, academies um okay. you know a painting of uh, of a nude and uh, I remembered that uh, I drew um, I drew cartoons for the high school yearbook, mm. and uh, I don't know something moved me to, uh, <laughs> to, of course. So I drew that drawing, and Milan Andreevich said, "You know, you 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 can do this, and if you uh, if you'd like to, so you should think about it." Mm. And he uh, said he taught it. Brooklyn College at the time, and he said, "Think about this for for graduate school." So uh, I loved doing it. Uh, just being in that attic um, was was yeah. really marvelous. Uh, Michael Lynch, I, I don't know how they got those casts up there because it was a narrow stairway. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Took the, a, a couple uh, windows out or a couple doors I, I can't out. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michelangelo's Dying Slave, a, a cast of Michelangelo's Dying Slave. Um, Huge. With its, yeah. uh, up, up, upraised um, elbow um, right. fit it within the interior of the of the steeple right so just perfectly um, yeah <laughs> it, it, it was just it was magical yeah. um, so I guess seven years went by after I graduated uh, I, I taught English um, prep school English kind mm. of as a way to recuperate from the thesis I was just talking about and um, yeah. After a couple of years of that, I thought, you know, I I don't think I want to continue teaching English. Mm. I knew I didn't want to go to a medical school or mm. anything like that. And um, nor did I really want to continue in graduate school in, in, um, in philosophy or history or anything like that. I just didn't, didn't feel quite cut out for it. I remembered Millet Andreevich saying, you know, what about, uh, you know, think about art for graduate school. And so yeah. at that point, um, I uh, tried to kind of reconnect with the New York Drawing Society, but mm. by then it had become the New York Academy of Art. And I uh, took, uh, they were offering a free year. <laughs> really? Uh, wow. Absolutely. Because they're not were, offering that anymore. <laughs> uh, they offered it then because they uh, were trying to uh, create a graduate program, and I think they needed uh, a class of guinea pigs. Sure, yeah. So it was just perfectly timed. Um, I took wow. a free free year, um, and uh, I, I had enough. Um, you know, I, when I taught, I. Uh, I managed to save a little a little bit of money because I had on campus housing, so mm. I had a tiny little uh, tiny little bit of money to spend on um, you know being able to concentrate full time. And then the next year was graduate school, and they had me teach in the graduate program. Really, the very next year, and I sort of remained there um, uh, teaching at New York Academy uh, f- until uh, I think about the year two thousand. Really? Wow. 2001. So it was about 15, uh, or no, it was about more like 18, 18 or 19 years. Right. Yeah. Um, at that point, I shifted to uh, the Lyme Academy College of, of Fine Arts, mm. um, where there was a rare endowed share in drawing. Mm. And uh, I remained at Lyme until it closed um, uh, in 2019. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, so, uh, it was it was Dean Keller, the the predecessor, yeah. and and so when he passed, the the position passed on to yes, uh, to the the, uh, the the chair was was open, and mm. 
Uh, I was uh, su super, you know, super fortunate uh, to um, to be able to con continue in that in that mm. chair. Now, my interest in um, anatomy, um, I have, uh, I, I, you know, I was starting to think about art in in, in college. I took a course on Michelangelo. And of course, an old master drawings uh, taught by um, David Kaufman. Um, and uh, those two courses, those two, my experience in those two courses uh, kind of re reignited my interest in, in drawing. And or these I courses, said, when you say you took them in college, uh, which college is that? You took them at the Art Princeton. Academy or, or Princeton? Okay, so this no. is when you were still uh, pursuing. I'm an undergrad. Right, right, right. Yeah. at Princeton and yeah. uh, I took a course on uh, uh, Michelangelo uh, taught by um, Professor Gibbons and then Professor Kaufman, David Kaufman uh, taught the course in old master mm -hmm. drawing. Mm -hmm. The course in old master drawings uh, was taught completely from the drawings in the Princeton University Museum collection. And the idea was that drawings uh, needed to be studied closely um, in the right. flesh. Right. And they have a fabulous collection of, um, of particularly it Italian Renaissance drawings. Mm. Um, I remember being very affected by the drawings of Luca Cambiasso, mm. um, which are highly non-literal uh, mm -hmm. drawings of the figure, as you know, you know, they're based on uh, kind, of a, a, kind of a cubic. Um, yeah, rectilinear, yeah. Yeah. Is, is there any, I mean, I, I have not researched him and I, I show his works uh, to my students, but I've, mm -hmm. and, you know, listen, I haven't ever read any books on the guy or anything like that, but I've never seen any work. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've seen one where there's kind of a, a young man with a quill in his hand uh, scribing something. And that's about as naturalistic as I've ever seen can be also mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. Everything else is like, you know, boxes piled on top of boxes, which is wonderful. But does he have naturalistic works? Yeah, he was a painter, and yeah. those ten, those were uh, those are naturalistic. But his yeah. reputation was based on his drawings. He was, uh, right. he was renowned in the sort of the, the generation after Michelangelo as mm. as uh, you know as a, as a draftsman. Mm. Um, it was particularly interesting. To, to me, the uh, you know the 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 life in drawings that were non natural you know were drawn non naturalistically quote right yeah um, that tremendous. I also was very uh, the course was taught at a graduate level. I, somehow I sort of snuck in as an undergrad, but um, uh, so I had the benefit of uh, of graduate students in in art art history uh, there in the seminar room. And uh, uh, it changed my life. Really, I didn't know it at the time, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it sort of changed my life because it uh, continued to haunt me. Mm -hmm. uh, these issues of, uh, you know, or orthodoxy versus, um, you know, marginal thinking. Um, and then this uh, fascinating uh, issue of... Um, non-naturalistic naturalism mm. uh, in Cambiasso's drawings. Right. Uh, and of course the Michelangelo course uh, was, you know, in tandem with the, with the, the drawing course, the old master uh, drawing course. Um, so uh, it continued to, you know, it sort of came back somehow after lying dormant for, for all those years uh, when I you know, thought I needed to uh, do something other than teach English. Mm. Um, and the New York Academy um, uh, opportunity uh, presented itself. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so my interest in, in uh, the, the Academy, there was a kind of a, an interest in, in anatomy. Uh, it's been part of the uh, sort of the academic program mm -hmm. for a long time. And the New York Academy was interested in reviving that program. Right. Um, and so I just kind of streamed, you know, streamed, streamed right in. I took a course there with uh, my anatomy teachers were Elliot Goldfinger. It was, uh, you know, written uh, probably the definitive a book mm -hmm. on human anatomy. And uh, also Paul, John Fania, um, who uh, taught at Brooklyn College. So uh, that's how the pieces c kind of fell fell together. And uh, I guess I've, I've had a career teaching, all, you know, over those all those decades. 
Um, uh, and uh, you know, you're right. Your 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 class was a high water mark. That's right. <laughs> uh, that was a fun time. I'll, I'll make a note for anybody listening. Uh, while I will say that I was doing well in that class, I was also like about 30 years old and everybody else was about 22. <laughs> so I had a little bit of an advantage, I think, over, and some and some drawing experience at that point. So I, if I if I kicked some butt, it was. Uh, <laughs> <with that. laughs> Yeah. Oh, was, uh, maybe uh, there's more than that, but you're. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I now that I hear um, this story, because I, you know, of course, I knew we've been friends for a while, and I, I knew some of your story, but never to that extent. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I'll reflect a little bit on on how I perceived you as an anatomy teacher, and then ask you a question. Um, you know, one of the things that I was I was noticed right away when when I took your class. Um, was, was that you, you viewed drawing as a discipline um, and you sort of approached it with a simultaneous passion and a, a kind of like clinical knowability. It was very demystified in your class. Um, and a lot of the drawing classes, I've never had an anatomy class before that. And in a lot of the drawing classes that I had before, if they touched on topics like these, it was very mystical. You know, it was like uh, how, how it is that a person came to know anatomy um, was through some, some very diffuse methodology that, that never really discussed the issue directly, <laughs> but somehow, you know, came to it um, through some combination of intuition uh, mm. like talent, um, you know, something like that. And, uh, and so, so I, it was very refreshing for me to, to be in that kind of environment, like the kind of, you know, besides the kind of teacher you were, the kind of environment you created was one in which, um, we studied, you know, we studied and we, we, I, I feel like we, we, tr we treated it like a discipline, um, and we treated it like a subject, you know, like a subject that had a history that was worth unraveling and worth, uh, you know, um, approaching in that way. And, and so the, the question I wanted to ask you maybe was, um, and maybe you're interested in this, maybe not, but, or, or maybe we're getting a little bit off topic, but how do you feel about something like talent? Because, you know, the, the story that I was expecting was that, you know, at least somewhere in that high school grammar school thing, you were going to tell me that you were drawing all the time. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's my story. You know, I've been drawing since, you know, there, there wasn't a time that I don't remember having some kind of scribbler in my hand. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, how, how do you feel about like the, the idea or the concept of talent, um, mm -hmm. having come to it, late when you did and in the way that you did where where it sounds like it came from uh a, a, a study it, it came from like a, a research uh, a process mm -hmm. almost as much as it did an artistic process yeah wow well let's let's see uh um i you know i think real real talent you know re real creativity is uh is, is uh you know is a, is a lightning strike Mm. Um, and, uh, I think that as a teacher, you're always sort of on, on the lookout for, for signs of, uh, of, of, of real talent. Um, and you're always anxious that your, you know, that your, your, um, your biases are, are going to blind you to, to mm. it. Um, I, I, you know, I found talent, uh, I found great talent and, um, in, in students, you know, who who could or sometimes uh, couldn't, quote unquote, you know, draw constructively. Mm, right. um, it seemed uh, it, it seemed to you know just sort of you know talent takes on a life of its of its own in the classroom. Um, you know, this this was all rather beside the point. You know, my my brief was was to. Uh, just just gorge the contents of my brain on the on the topic of um, uh, how um, anatomy has been approached um, artistically in, mm -hmm. in drawings, um, and uh, to point out you know what it is uh, that's discernible in drawings of this of this of the sort um, that evinces 
talent. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, you know, I would approach it by saying, well, talent is, uh, is, is usually shows up as a sort of a, a non-literalism. Mm. Um, mm. Talent, you know, shows up uh, not just as, as technical facility, um, but as a kind of a curiosity um, in making mm. um, uh, that is, well, that's able to see all the different components of the process and uh, and and to kind of explore what happens when you take one of the unheralded parts of the of the process and make it the guide of the process. Mm. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, talent always seems to revive the process in in uh, in that way. Mm. So, uh, I mean, I always expected the the talented students were going to be the ones who, um, uh, in, in some regard you know, we're going to reflect something I'd said back to me mm. in a way that I, uh, that I barely recognized. Um, and that that was a thrill when that, mm. when that happened. Um, and, uh, you know, I had uh, at Lyme and in New York, uh, I had, you know, students who would do that you know, you're included Jesse. Um, so, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, in, in terms of how I kind of approached it in, in approached anatomy in the class, you know, you mentioned uh, that it was uh, sort of a subject that could, could be studied mm-hmm. um, and that it wasn't uh, mysterious, notwithstanding everything I just said about, about talent. Um, yeah, I guess it, it, you know, in college I was taught to be precise in, in my, uh, in my communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was given tools for kind of, wrestling a, a subject um, down analytically, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you can bring a subject under uh, intellectual control. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think, a, you know, artistic anatomy is an instance where um, individuals uh, bring their subject under intellectual control. Mm-hmm. And then the subject I was teaching, which was how that happened, uh, I was always interested in bringing under intellectual control and mm. then sort of, uh, you know, sharing the results of that effort with, with, uh, with students. Mm. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, what was wonderful about it is that um, anatomy um, uh, has many sort of con- concrete components. Um, there are, uh, there, there are, there are books, there are, um, there's sort of lots of, uh, groundwork, lots of things are, uh, established, uh, there's lots of agreement on, on anatomical, anatomical phenomena. Um, we can subject it to sort of geometrical analysis, mm. um, and, and in doing so, uh, clarify, um, that, that phenomena, and uh, you know, particularly if you're if um, you know your mind works in a geometrical mm. al- along geometric lines, um, it was uh, you know it, it was uh, a great subject. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is so what you're kind of um, mentioning is just a sort of a educational kind of an educational mindset mm. and the values that I. Um, that I abided by in, in mm. approaching my classes. I'd rather the, the mysterious sounding statements, you know, the enigmatic statements, uh, lack of clarity, fuzziness. Um, I always, uh, always, you know, sort of bothered me. Mm. So I tried to right. steer as, as much in the other direction as possible right. without making anatomy into something mechanical. Right. right but always right. to kind of, always kind of point to its, uh, the it's uh, the artistry involved mm. and there's something i want to I mention to you i think is important um you know in the nude uh, kenneth clark begins the book by saying the nude is uh a form of art and that uh, mm. our art form you know is uh, sort of com- comprised of uh, of practices uh and that we could sort of codify but it was also um um sort of animated by uh 
by other things. And so um, by treating it as this anatomy as a form of art, rather than a, a subject of art, I think I was able to um, see see it a little differently than I think it tends to be, you know, approached. Uh, because in most of the uh, approaches I've, I've seen, uh, anatomy is, is uh, treated as a, as a subject of art. Mm-hmm. So it is uh, simply a, you know, it's just a, uh, it's just a series of, of facts uh, that uh, need to be absorbed. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, once absorbed, they can be sort of w- without, um, they, once absorbed, they, they can then be sort of uh, exported into one's artwork. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so, I, you know, I just think that that's, that's not how, that's not, that's not the mojo at all. It's not, you know, what I see in, um, in, uh, in any of the drawings that, that uh, have these, um, have an anatomical, I won't call it a basis, but an anatomical flavor. And right, right. that, uh, you know, events, these sort of signs of life. For instance, the Cambiasso. Mm. Cambiasso drawings are no less anatomical um, for not articulating origins and insertions of individual muscles. Right, uh, right. So, um, you know, they... Uh, or uh, they show the uh, body's major masses, uh, each moving dynamically in its own trajectory. Yeah. Um, and is that an anatomical fact? Well, uh, yeah, I guess it's an anatomical mm. fact. Um, what, what anatomy does is it kind of uh, rushes in behind that artistic idea and uh, kind of fleshes it out to some extent. Right. The artistic idea is, is an anatomical the artistic idea that governs artistic anatomy isn't anatomical per se. Right. right, right. Um, and um, taking stock of the, of the body's movements and um, making those movements vivid and precise. Mm. Uh, and that sometimes calls for a specific anatomical um, sequence of form um, and uh, sometimes it sometimes it doesn't. Um, so, uh, subject uh, of art anat- anatomy is not. Um, uh, it will always fall flat if approached that way. But uh, as a form of art, um, the, now we're talking. It's right, something different. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, one of the things I noticed, uh, we, uh, Randy and I had a conversation before this to kind of warm us up to this conversation. One of the things I noticed in that conversation um, was that, you know, I think, I think generally we, we approach anatomy a little bit differently in terms of how we use it for our artistic purposes. And maybe it has something to do with the way uh, we were brought into anatomy. Uh, like I said, for me, it was... Um, it was nowhere to be found. Uh, you know, it sounds like for you, it was everywhere to be found, right? It was kind of embedded in the religiosity of what you were studying. And then it immediately perfectly transitioned into a school that um, emphasized, if not fetishizes that as a subject. Uh, and, and for me, it was, it was nowhere to be found. There was no anatomy. Uh, you know, I had Stephen Roger Peck's Atlas of Anatomy I, I, I got it when I was 14 years old because I knew that that book had some answers for me, but I couldn't read it. I opened it up and I tried to read it and I, I couldn't read it. And, it, you know, because it's like uh, it, half of it's kind of Latin, right? And I'm like 14 and I don't, not, I don't have any help. <laughs> and so I looked at the pictures, right? But, but I think I was looking at the wrong pictures for a long time. I was looking at the very rendered pictures in, in uh, Peck's anatomy book. I wasn't looking at where he was making metaphors or simplifying forms. I was skipping those pages. Uh, and so it wasn't until later I figured out how to use that book. And it wasn't, you know, until later when I took some classes, uh, you know, not, not just anatomy classes like yours, but also just drawing classes, just, just better and more focused drawing classes. Uh, that I started to understand what the what the value of like Stephen Roger Peck's book was in relationship to like Elliot Goldfinger's book or any of the other anatomy books and and how they relate to each other. Um, but anyway, back to the point. I, I think 
you know, for me, my, uh, my artistic career was uh, definitely focused conceptually. And my instructors uh, w- became satisfied with anatomical execution, let's say a little bit prematurely, right? So if you could, uh, you know, even a little bit figure out a figure, they right away were like, you've got it. You're, you're an anatomical master, <laughs> you know? And it was quite, it was very confusing. Like, I, I think that that was a mistake some of my teachers made. Um, and, uh, and it kept me from really finding what I was looking for because they, they told me that I had already found it. And, and I, I thought, I guess I thought I found it. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, I'm already doing this right. Or I'm already doing this in the best, most useful, most whatever way. And it, I don't think that that was the case. So anyway, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know, I think for me, uh, anatomy, you know, I was making art like a, like, like a mile a minute uh, the whole time, whether I knew anatomy or didn't know anatomy or knew how to use it or, or didn't. And so I've, I've always been making art despite the mechanism that maybe helps me make art now. And, and so I've always used anatomy as that, you know, I, I don't know if that makes it, a, what was the distinction you said Kenneth Clark made between a subject and a, what's the other one? Form. The a form, form of right. So, so I don't know, that, it, that's interesting that you said that. I, I've actually strangely never read that book. It's a real gap in my like, <laughs> of knowledge base. I should, should read that book. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, but, but anyway, I don't know how I fit into that categorization or even if I do, um, mm-hmm. Because I, I, you know, I, the way that I think about anatomy, the way that I use anatomy is as a problem solving mechanism. So, so the way that I think about it is, is that you have a composition and parts of those compositions are powered or are, are, are made vibrant by different mechanisms. And sometimes those mechanisms can be best resolved by understanding anatomy and deploying some of the like let's say anatomical motifs that mm-hmm. you might be facile with <laughs> you know that's that's how i think about it right like i have a couple it, to put it as crudely as possible i have a couple tricks up my sleeve and mm-hmm. when i need those anatomical tricks i can deploy them for you know for better or for worse it, it, maybe that makes that moment trite or maybe that makes that moment you know uh, mm-hmm. interesting in some way but I kind of think of it like my, my images or my sculptures are compositional. And when I want anatomy to solve a problem, that's mm-hmm. when I use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it seems to me, it occur- I, mean, I mean, I'm making an assumption here. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like your relationship to anatomy is far more philosophically ingrained to the concept of the work itself. Uh, it, and, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that or about the work that you're making now, uh, mm-hmm. and, and how it is that, you know, are you moving, do you feel like mm-hmm. you're moving a, a, away from anatomy or is anatomy always part and parcel of what mm-hmm. it is that you do? Mm-hmm. Um, how does it fit into, you know, you as an artist in mm-hmm. the present? Well, you know, I, I was always interested in, um, anatomy's role in art when it was all being worked out. Mm. So uh, I guess earlier on, um, you know, uh, leading up to the high Renaissance mm. uh, with, uh, with Michelangelo and, and Leonardo um, and uh, maybe soon after, um, with, uh, you know, this, this towering, what to do about this towering example of Michelangelo's accomplishment mm-hmm. and how do we, how do artists, uh, carry the project forward without imitating mm-hmm. that. Um, but you already see at that point, the artistic challenge of, um, what to do with, a a, 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 a form of poetry that, um, is already beginning to kind of ossify. Um, and and set uh, because the exciting and uh, exciting era in artistic anatomy is is when it was all when it was all new and right. uh, and by new I mean you know when they were kind of rediscovering 
uh, classical sculpture. I mean, literally unearthing uh, unearthing classical sculpture and uh, the astonishment they felt at the the, the sort of the the uh, expressiveness and the evident role of um, of uh, anatomical uh, knowledge. And uh, you know how did this happen? This 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 uh, you know uh, light uh, lightning bolt. Mm. Um, and so artists uh, then set about trying to uh, you know without knowing the answer ahead of time, but having a kind of exemplar, figuring out how um, how uh, an uh, anatomy you know sort of worked uh, in its own sake, but how also to uh, incorporate it into into uh, figurative art, how to create a sense of figural presence um, with gesture, um, volume, scale, and pathos. Um, uh, now, at that point, um, you know, once they kind of f- figured it out and sort of the ground had been covered, you know, like any sort of new poetic language, it just started to uh, uh, started to. I guess the well was dry and mm-hmm. artists would use those, um, use those images, those metaphors uh, as, you know, as, as sort of ways to get through certain problems as you, as you mentioned. Um, and they uh, were, had been sustaining in that way, sort of, um, you know, they've been fulfilling that purpose really ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, but that I'm not sure it's ever been quite the same as it was um, at that p- uh, period when you had Durer and, uh, mm. and Michelangelo and other uh, you know graphic artists of genius grappling with the uh, grappling with the issue almost for the first time. Mm. I mean, almost as though for the first time, and so they created a, a, a poetic language, a visually poetic language. And at that point, that language, uh, like, you know, I think there's also uh, a section in the, the Kenneth Clark book, you know, where he talks about that language having upset like concrete. Mm. And it no longer serves a poetic purpose. It serves other purposes. Right. Um, so uh, I always just tried to kind of mm, try to, in my classes and in my work, uh, try to um, steer more towards the, that uh, that time when anatomy was um, was poetic because it was new, mm-hmm. because it wasn't uh, it wasn't codified, it wasn't wasn't worked out. Right. Um, you know, also took it that during this period, um, you know, artists weren't simply uh, drawing the way the figure looked, or mm-hmm. were not simply drawing anatomical facts, but were um, drawing kind of all the ways the figures could be seen as examples of the kinds of shapes and graphic symbols that they already knew how to make and Mm. already enjoyed making. So um, uh, that's the basis of the poetry of of anatomy is a, um, is a, um, is a a, a graphic language Mm. essentially. And so the magic happened when that graphic language, which, um, you know, consisted of, uh, fairly, fairly straightforward kind of graphic symbols, you know, Mm -hmm. S curves, arcs, Mm -hmm. um, when that uh, graphic language, um, became, um, sort of the, uh, 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 an interpretive system for, for anatomy. Mm. And so you had uh, suddenly, you know, uh, marriage of those two things. You had, you had new, you had new, new forms that seemed to open up a whole new domain of uh, sort of thought and feeling. That's where it's at for for me. Um, I'm uh, currently interested in um, in those, you know, the characteristics of the drawing that that make it look drawn, mm. uh, and that um, uh, that put on display the um, activity of the of the artist mm. mm-hmm. um, and um, so uh, right now I'm sort of uh, making a lot of uh, drawings in in ink um, in uh, that are um, uh, made with uh, the kinds of uh, 
the system of lines and uh, uh, lines that are characteristic of uh, engraving. So mm-hmm. we have uh, uh, swelling lines, lines that, you know, taper and swell and then taper again. Mm. And that also are non-value-based, um, uh, but instead are based on topographies uh, rather than on tonalities. Okay. Um, so there's a certain kind of um, engraving uh, where sort of the lines take on the value of color. Right. Uh, but then there's a certain kind of engraving, uh, which I think is um, particularly brilliant. Um, you know, it was practiced by uh, Holtzius, for instance, um, uh, and De Kain, uh sort of the Dutch um, Dutch engravers, uh, where um, the um, characteristics, the the surface, uh, where the um, uh, characteristics of paths through space, um, rising and falling, uh, changing their orientation. Um, uh, that's more the the basis of the visual language. Mm. Um, and so I see that as a visual, you know, starting with a visual language, um, a, a sort of a descriptive system or an interpretive system, mm. and then um, using that as a fil- sort of a, a filtering device mm. for um, other things. Yeah. So what are those other things? Uh, well, those other things, uh, I'm not sure what those other, other things are. Those other things, uh, you know, might be what other folks would call subject matter, which I reluctant to call subject matter um, mm. because the minute you mentioned subject matter um, uh, people's heads turn and see the subject matter as mm. the key to the, right. to the artwork. When in fact um, the horse and car relationship is completely different. So the subject matter is created by the form. Right. Um, and so the subject matter is in the cart and the, the form sense, the, the visual language, that's on the, on the horse. Right. Uh, most of the time people see it as uh, completely, uh, completely, you know, re- the reverse. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people make art in that way, right? Like they make art with the subject matter guiding their decisions. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The and whole. I, oh, I remember, yeah. I remember when, when I was in class with you, it's something that I actually repeat to my students. I remember you said something so simple uh, and I, I loved it so much. You said, I like drawings that look like drawings. And, mm-hmm. and, and in some ways it seemed like a reaction to the, the, wherever this comes from, the intuition that students have to just veer like a car heading down a hill towards a river into photorealism. Like, like as <laughs> if that's the only inevitability of, of like the finer your artwork gets, the closer it gets to perfect photorealism. And, and in a way, you know, it, it seemed like a reaction to that. But, but I knew when you said that, it, it wasn't reactionary to, uh, mm-hmm. to, to not liking. It's not about not liking photorealism. It really is about preferring seeing the, the, the value and the material and the language of a drawing pronounce itself in the meaning of a drawing. And I, I always really valued that, that statement. And I always feel like, you know, when I say it, when I repeat it, I, you know, I give you credit every time, but, uh, but I'm never sure that, you know, I, I always feel like it, it, to, to, to get across that meaning, it, it, t- it takes like another two hours, you know, <laughs> like it's, if, if somebody doesn't already understand it, if they don't go, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. then, you know, it, it's another two or four or, or maybe a lifetime worth of, of talking and thinking to, to figure that out. Um, well, you know, there's a book, uh, called, uh, drawing distinctions by Patrick Maynard, mm. uh, where, um, he, he discusses, um, the, the importance of the drawn look of the drawing. Mm. So, uh, I want to give, uh, you know, uh, thanks for that shout out, but I want to <laughs> get back to, uh, yeah. to pa- Patrick Maynard's work as, as well. And uh, yeah, so, so a Cambiasso drawing, uh, I, I can't imagine anything. It looks less like a photograph. Right. Yeah. Um, and yet it is more uh, accurate mm. of um, um, important aspects of, um, mm. you know, in important aspects of, of the body mm. Then it, it then can be can be expressed in in the photograph. Every art form, 
um, sort of has its own truths. Mm. And uh, so if, if the purpose of the drawing is, um, you know, to simply reflect truths that are with greater detail um, uh, um, represented in other art forms, then, uh, you know, so right. much for drawing. Right, right. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's not, you know, uh, photography is, is perfect, is fine as, as, an art, as an art form. Yeah. I think it's funny what you say about the car careening down the, <laughs> the valley. I, I, you know, I see that. I think that's yeah. sort of taken as, uh, I, I think it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to me how unconscious that is, how unacknowledged mm. that, that mm. is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so uh, the, let's see, you know, when I was in high school playing a lot of drums, it, uh, it was sort of a, it was like drum competitions. And um, there are even, which which persist and um, now you can see a lot of TikTok videos with with drummers, but you know there were you know snare drumming competitions and right. you but it's up until the you know aughts or something buy CDs of snare drummers. Mm. Well, what's cool about snare drumming is you know you listen to this if you're a drummer you listen to someone's uh, playing a snare drum and you you know you you can follow them you you know. Yeah you know, you know what they're doing and yeah. it becomes alive to you. So, uh, you know, a drawing of Cambiasso or Michelangelo, I, you know, you, you're looking rather than listening, but you can almost hear them at work. Uh, you, 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 there's, you know, all those things that are unique to, to drawing. Yeah. You, you see a human being, right. uh, flesh and blood and intellect and heart. And, um, it's, it's visible to you. Yeah. And uh, their sensibility and their activities um, as a reflection of their sensibilities um, create the meaning of the work. They create the subject where work mm. there. I think uh, David Dewey would call it, they, are, they constitute the substance of the work. The substance mm. of the work is, in, in the case of a drawing, is, is, are all the things that contribute toward, towards its drawn look. And that's the portal to um, to the special meaning that a drawing, mm. special meanings that, that drawings can convey and, and open up. So, um, yeah, I was never happy, you know, being able, I, I, I could sort of do it, you know, I, I pretty quickly, but I was never just in terms of making something look like something, mm-hmm. um, following anatomical moves um, I, and kind of uh, replicating them. But um, I was never satisfied with, mm. with that because it's, um, it's an art form and art forms uh, have you know, standards of uh, standards of um, kind of creativity and imagination and um, ongoing development that, mm. uh, you know, you, you ignore at your peril. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that, you know, that high Renaissance, mm, that high Renaissance uh, accomplishment of creating f- figural presence. Mm. I'm pretty sure that um, that sense of figural presence is incommensurate with uh, photography. Mm. So uh, now it's not to, it's no knock on photography, but I don't think f- photography provides that yeah um i think i think photography right is is, is a record mm. um and um no you can't have a, a presence and a record at the same time right it's mm. uh, sort of one or the other mm. so um maybe a uh, photographer would argue with you about that but <laughs> <laughs> we're, yeah. we'll get a I photographer on <laughs> uh, listen photography is an art form yeah and i i would uh you know i would no sooner hold photography to uh drawing standards right than, right yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah. it's an odd I, thing right that that somehow that somehow photography has become an umpire uh by which you know every move that a, that a drawing is made and it's really only in a, in a certain viewpoint right it's it's like a certain kind of mind frame that that you can take on where you might where you might look for a drawing to become that but uh, just statistically, having, I mean, you know, I've been teaching for 11 years or something like that. Um, you've been teaching for a while and it's just, it just shows up a lot. Everywhere you look. 
Everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's more, more students think like that and, and desire that than, than desire something else or desire what we just discussed. Well, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I've never been able to use photographs. Mm. I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't much yeah, either. So far the field. Uh, I just can't get from them what I, mm, mm, what I, what I'm looking for. I seem so sort of solid state to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, landlocked. I, I had a conversation with a student recently, and and I was, you know, imploring her to to not use photographs, and and she was describing to me a, a method by which uh, she would use photographs to to develop a value structure um, in her drawing, and I said, you know, I was I was saying something like, well, you know, don't you think that uh, that you what you get from your eyes uh, does a better job of seeing that value structure of interpreting and she that your iphone does and she was like no <laughs> she was like no it doesn't <laughs> and i was like whoa okay <laughs> so so we had a like a two-hour talk about that <laughs> you know i was like okay everything has to grind to a halt we have to talk a lot about this um yeah. but that was an interesting response you know to to just yeah. like kind of say like no i don't see it that way i actually i think the iphone does a really good job of yeah. uh, you know interpreting for me um, right Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, your, your eye. And then also I, I would argue your, your media. I, I think mm. the media, you know, determines, uh, of course, yeah. value yeah. structures, you know, um, chiaroscuro drawings, mm. uh, drawings, uh, defined as, uh, drawings done on a, on a, a fairly dark prepared surface, mm. um, using, uh, white really is the predominant, uh, incisive force right to mm. bring out uh, forms yeah as michael baxendall points out um uh such drawings are not nocturnes you know they're they're not drawings of things happening at night mm. Mm. um mm. Uh, they have a value structure uh, all their own uh, that right. value structure is a uh, sort of um an, an artifact of the of the media and right. what the media can do, uh, it's, it's handling properties and what artists have been able to do uh, with them. And so you have the sense, this incredible sense in a chiaroscuro drawing, uh, notwithstanding its, its, its name and its putative connection to value, um, <laughs> but you have a tremendous sense of abstract movement mm. across the page. True, yeah. Uh, and so in that case, light is actually, again, it's in the, it's it's in the cart, not on the horse. And uh, light it's is being uh, uh, given the charge of of movement. Um, mm. None of this is available to the artist who is uh, just working with with the photographs. Right, now, right. other things are available to them. Yeah. lots yeah. of other things, and I suspect that's what they're yeah. they're sensing. These yeah. your your student and just about everybody else that. Uh, and so that's fine, yeah. but I really think it's important to make all of these distinctions. You yeah. know, what yeah, the difference yeah. in form of art, subject of art. What's what? What do different arts, art forms do? Yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, it uh, you know I think we uh, well. What does it really matter? I mean, an artist with real talent is just going to make what they make, right? And right. we'll all sort of struggle to catch up to yeah. that. But. Yeah. Um, in my own work, I have always thought it was important to make these these sorts of key distinctions. You know, keeping yeah. keeping things straight to do to do justice to uh, to them to them all as art forms. Uh, yeah. And so, we're not asking photographers to do what drawers right, do, right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, or 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 vice versa, right, right. So, but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it all has to do with my first, you know, that that the attic of marble collegiate church mm. was uh, completely analog. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Some somehow like gained access to my heart, and that's right, kind of right. where I've been this this whole time, and kind of fits and starts. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I wanted to share a little bit, Randy, about how how it is that that I came to anatomy as well. Um, we talked a little bit about that before. Um, but I wanted to kind of flesh it out in light of a conversation that that 
comes back a little bit to education. Um, and, and one of the goals that I have for this conversation, besides just to hear your thoughts on anatomy, uh, is to, to hear what it is that you think about uh, how people that are really, really seeking this kind of information or this kind of knowledge maybe could or should go about it. And um, when I, when, you know, when I was, when I was in high school, right, like my, my art origin, when I was even before that, it was all comic books, you know, like, I, I mean, I had never been to a museum, uh, an art museum, even though New York City was just an hour away. Uh, I didn't get to the, to the Met until I was at the School of Visual Arts when I was 19. Uh, so it was all comic books, you know, and I, I, I love them to death now. I read comics all the time. And when I was young, I, I read them very seriously. You know, like I, I enjoyed them. I read them as a, as a consumer. Um, but I also knew, like just from reading them, I was like, oh, this is someone's job. You know, so when people came to me with these kind of warnings, like, oh, you know, artists can't make a living or artists, blah, blah, blah. I just thought, well, you know, I can do this. Like, this will be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, I, you know, and there's a lot of anatomy in, in comics, right? There's especially, you know, in this era that I was reading them. I, I, I'm guessing you're not as familiar with like 1990s era uh, comics, uh, <laughs> but uh, he's shaking his head no. <laughs> but anyway, it's kind of infamous for being quite experimental in its relationship to drawing and not always in such a good way. Um, and anatomy is the same. Like it, 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 a lot of people were really, really, really either playing with anatomy in a very strange design sense or um, just really frankly didn't like know anatomy very well or proportion very well. And we're just sort of cobbling it together in a, in a kind of strange sense. Um, and, uh, you know, while, you know, all of that, you can, you can debate the, the aesthetics and the merits of it. Um, for me, it, it, it taught me one very, very important thing, which was like anatomy is totally negotiable, you know, and, and, and comic books, they, uh, they, the, the, the very essence of comic books is that, it, well, at least these kind of like superhero comics that I was reading is that they're fantastic, right? Like you, like they're not to be believed. We don't, we don't mistake them for reality. Um, and, and the way in which those artists also like kind of internalized that and said, well, well, listen, as long as I make the story feel real, uh, as long as I make the anatomy feel real, then it's real. And that's it, you know, and that, that, that was as negotiable as, as anything that I had known to that point. And I just thought, wow, like, you know, these, these people can do anything. And so I was really mesmerized by that. Um, somehow it, it, it didn't lead me down that path really. Right. I mean, my, my, I think my artwork doesn't usually remind people that I'm, I'm such a comics fan, even though I am, I, I just, I love them. I teach them. Uh, anytime I'm in a drawing class or a sculpture class, I'm always bringing out, you know, <laughs> comics to, to make some kind of uh, a corollary relationship between how it is that I think about drawing or this or that in relationship to comics. Um, but by the time I got to, to college, um, you know, I, I, I applied to and I, I went to the School of Visual Arts. Um, and I knew when I went, uh, that I could probably only stay about one year. And uh, that was my foundation year. And foundation year is not, you don't take anatomy class in your foundation year, right? You just take drawing class. And the, you know, the, the teachers are totally varietal. Uh, and the, the teachers that I had were, were not particularly anatomically inclined. Um, so, you know, I, I really valued my time there. That was uh, such an important year. Um, and, and one of the reasons that it was important was because it, it, it kind of juxtaposed a lot of attitudes for me, or, or there was a lot of contradictions working at the same time. And uh, three things that stand out to me when I was at the School of Visual Arts. Um, uh, one was that a lot of my foundation teachers were like um, very intuitive very experimental kinds of artists uh, that were not mired in any way in realism or anatomy. 
And so they were pushing me in directions. You know, I came in like an illustrative kid. You know, I came in like a Frank Frazetta fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I had no use for the Barnett Newmans of the world, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, so, so they were pushing me to understand something else. And at the same time, Steve Asale is teaching there. Max Ginberg is teaching there. And there's two, there's three students there that, you know, for me, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm in contact with some of them. I didn't know them. I knew one of them. I knew a guy named Farrell Dalrymple, who's a comic book artist. He's fantastic. Uh, there's another guy named James Jean who was there. And James Jean's a very famous illustrator. Uh, and the other guy who was there uh, is, is Nick, Nicholas Uribe. And I didn't know James or, or Nicholas, um, but you know, the, the reverberations of the power of these people's work at that age was tremendous. They were echoing, you know, it was echoing in the halls of the school. Nobody could deny the, just the, the sheer power of the work that they were making at the time, the, just the unbelievable professionalism of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so, so that was an interesting kind of contrast. And then the third thing that happened right at that time is Egon Sheila had a retrospective at the MoMA and everybody went and saw it and everybody got their hair blown back. You know, I mean, it was just, it's Egon Sheila, right? And, and, you know, that's the right, if there's, I don't know if there's a right age to be impressed by Egon Sheila, but 19 is it, you know, I mean, like, I feel like that. Well, uh, he wasn't much, uh, he was that, he was that age as well. He was a young that's guy. Right. That's right. Yeah. And, and he passed away at 28, I believe. Right. Yeah. Or something like that, you know? Very young. So, so, so those three things were kind of like rolling around in my head, right. You have Egon Chile, who's, who's, you know, as experimental as these comic book artists, right. Twisting and turning and, and, and transforming this idea of anatomy and then you have these teachers that are, you know, uh, uh, Steve Asale, Max McGinnberg. I wouldn't say that they're mired in it, but I would say that they're, they're steeped in it, right? Like they know this stuff, they, 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 they're handy with it uh, and they understand it functionally. And then I had a bunch of teachers that weren't and those teachers um, were issuing me warnings instead of, um, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise. And when I left the School of Visual Arts, I went to a different school called the College of New Jersey where I, I mean, I really had a nice time there. I uh, had great teachers, great teachers. None of them had any kind of sense of representational authority at all. Um, and even the figure drawing teacher there was an abstract painter who painted just shapes. And she was really cool. You know, she was like a really interesting lady and, and but it was very difficult to um, transcend where you were uh, with a person who was, you know, uh, uh, wanted to just completely steer you in a different direction um, and, and could never, ever, ever talk to you about, you know, what's going on with the bicep, right? Um, and, and these people were particularly issuing me warnings. And the warnings were, um, if you uh, study anatomy too much, then you become mired in it, right? The trappings of anatomy, they, they, they grasp you, they, 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 cling on to your mind and you can't let go of them. So you have to be careful of that. And, uh, you know, it, it, there are many, many kind of conversations like that. Um, and, and so these warnings were, were afoot, you know, they were, they were kind of like alive at the school and, and some people, you know, even some of the students really believed in them. They, they thought, well, I better not, you know, teach anatomy. And another one of those warnings was one that sounded like this, uh, you know, um, you should learn anatomy and then you should forget it, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I like, I, I like that one. I think that's true. It's like, you should, you should learn it. And then as you talked about before, like, you know, how do you keep it from ossifying? How do you, how do you make it new again? Uh, so, okay. Right. Um, but my question was like, but when am I going to learn it? <laughs> you know, like, like which one of you is going to teach it to me? And they're like, not me. <laughs> right. And so, so it was this kind of like perpetuating cycle of, of passing a student on who clearly was interested in this direction and just everybody saying like, not it, not it, not it. 
And <laughs> even, even to the point where when I did find, I, I had uh, many good professors there. Like I studied with a guy named Charles Kumnick, who I still speak with today. He's a great friend. He introduced me to everything in sculpture. You know, he wasn't figurative either, um, but everything in sculpture, you know, he was kind of, a, I mean, he's made some figurative work. He's a furniture maker, a jeweler, a sculptor, um, but just an all around fantastic materials guy. And, and I, I wouldn't pass up that experience for anything. I had a guy named Mark Shatabi um, who was, was again, like steeped in this language of how Velasquez made paintings of how, how it was that Goya made paintings. And he wasn't an anatomy expert either, but he could like manage that language. Right. And he was the one guy who could kind of talk to me about, you know, how to grind pigments and maybe what's going on with the bicep. But, but when I found him, I mean, we were like peas in a pot, you know, we loved each other instantly. And he was like, let's do a, you know, let's do a, uh, an independent study together. And then the, the, I was like, yeah, I only want to do all my study with you forever. You know, I was like, I mean, we just loved it so much. And, and then the school was like, no way we're not doing an independent study like that, that it, we don't. And they said that they, they sat me down and they said, these are not our values. And, and it was, it was basically, it was like a, a, it was kind of like a master copy kind of, uh, 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 independent study where I would be making a series of master copies and then a series of originals. That sounds like a class to me. We didn't have anything like that. This is the dude to teach it for sure. And they just said, no way, this is, this is, this cannot be part of our curriculum. So systematically and representationally, meaning like, like both the system and who was there to teach within that system just absolutely left me no options. So that's why, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I end up, you know, in your, in your classroom at 30, right? Because what, what happened was I, I went and I got my master's degree and I went to the Rhode Island School of Design and boy, I could not have gotten a better education. What a, you know, I mean, I paid a fortune for that thing and what a deal. I mean, my goodness, you know, it changed my life in a million ways and it still is changing my life. You know, like it's, it was fantastic. Can't say enough about it, but, you know, I still did, you know, I, I went all the way through my master's degree and I never had a demo. Nobody ever did a demonstration for me before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, there's a certain kind of teaching or a certain way or a certain mentality that, that embraces this stuff. But I think a lot of people, um, you know, if, if we compare our stories where, where somehow, you know, the, 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 the course of the river just kind of swept you along right into a very se seemingly a, a quite linear path um, where what you wanted to study was what you studied. Um, for me, it was, it was different. I had to like get out of my river, stay on land for a while, jump yeah. in a different river, pay for that river, you know, and, and that's what I did when I, I got, I got out of graduate school. And Portage I went to a term, uh, sorry, take, canoe out of the river and the exactly. struggle through the bush. Uh. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I did, I, I, when I got done with my master's degree, I, I went to the Watts Atelier. I saved, I worked for years and then I saved up a bunch of money and I went out for one month to the Watts Atelier. And, and that's why when you said, you know, when I, when I came into your class, I was very fast because I was always fast drawer, but the, but Watts taught me, uh, not not necessarily anatomy, but they taught me a, about how to structure uh, a, a routine around getting the results that you wanted. And, th and that routine was around analyzing proportional relationships and making shapes, making shapes that make sense and identifying shapes. And 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 then there's anatomy within that. They, they were also very interested in anatomy. But there was no really sense of a, a conceptual nature there. You know, their, their sense of when they're teaching concept is entirely in the realm of illustrative. Um, so, which is fine. I, I'm really into that. I, that's stuff that I absolutely love. And I, that four weeks at Watts was hmm. tremendous. You know, it was really good. Wow. Then, then I come to line and then, you know, the pieces are just continually starting to kind of fit together for me. And then, you know, my concepts and my ambitions are starting to 
fit with my skill sets. Mm -hmm. But my question for you is, you know, uh, educationally speaking, like, you know, if you're teaching the Randy Mellick School of Art, um, you know, you're the boss of all things. How do you think about structuring that? You, you know, those warnings that, that those teachers gave me, um, they were a little bit misplaced, mainly because there wasn't an anatomy teacher to teach me. You know, like, like, like the, that, I, I always said like that, that abstract painter that taught my figure drawing class, she's a great person to take a figure drawing class with. If you're taking a figure drawing class with like a figure drawing person too, you know, like you need those things yeah. to kind of fight with each other, but it was just her. So all I was getting was those warnings, but those warnings are valid in a way. Like we do have to beware of the trappings of anatomy, right? You already spoke to that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we do have to make sure that we're not becoming ossified or stale and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so, you know, how, it, when it comes to either learning, like, if, you know, if you're talking directly to a student or even if you're talking about just the state of art in general, like of art school, I should say in general, um, how, how do you think about designing courses or, or designing educations? Um, when, when I think, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, I feel like uh, this kind of art making requires fitness. You know, like you got to practice, you got to work out to maintain it. And if you don't, you lose some of it. You lose some of the dexterity that you that you need to execute. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so how do you relate that to it? It's a confusing conversation, even for me teaching 11 years that that fits somewhere in between, you know, arts and sports uh and education and you know like like education and other disciplines and somewhere in there there there's an equation that uh, about how we structure a class that includes fitness that includes yeah. you know art history and context and includes conceptualizations well first of all i you know i see now in listening to your own story um uh, how you know uh, how much determination and mm. um gumption it took on your part to gain, um, you know, access to the, the tools that you, mm -hmm. that you felt you needed. It was a, a matter of, you know, changing, changing schools, mm -hmm. you know, negotiating the, the, the rapids in your kayak and then getting <laughs> that, really to it, you know, somewhere else. It, it's just, you know, I, I just feel like there was, um, it was just it felt, I don't know. I, I, I lucked out in uh, finding, you know, people who uh, seemed to have insight into um, things into the art that moved me. Mm. And maybe if I had to fight a little bit more, work a little bit more for it by, you know, changing my life mm. more than I, I did, um, I might not have, who knows, might not have happened. Um, because um, so, so I, you know, I think it was just exemplary how it's a, it's an inspiring story. The one Thanks. that you tell. Um, uh, now as, you know, as regards, uh, you know, it, how I might uh, so, sort of structure a school. Um, uh, well, you know, I, it's, I would mention a couple of things. All those things that you mentioned sound very familiar, you know, to me. Mm -hmm. I, I've had such conversations. I, you know, I can, I can hear the, hear, still hear the, hear them in my ears um, about uh, the difference between, uh, you know, concept, concept and, um, uh, and realism, representationalism, importance of foundation. In general, there is a kind of a distinction that is drawn that I disagree with. And that is there is such a thing as a foundation. Mm. And one provides a foundation, and then, of course, one can go on and do whatever one wants. Yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, it all usually um, ties into a related sort of division, and that is that um, in representation, uh, representational, well, representation is uh, built upon a, a sort of a non-controversial set of, of skills, mm -hmm. teachable skills, uh, but that the um, at a certain point, maybe after about two years of study, uh, one 
has sufficient handle on those skills, then to start thinking about what really is uh, the, the meat of the matter, mm -hmm. you know, which is uh, content. And at that point, you have to, as an artist, know what it is um, you want to say. Mm -hmm. So it's the having something to say argument that builds on this, this kind of division between uh, straightforward skill acquisition, acquisition and then this other, this other thing that gets added on top of that, mm -hmm. like, a, like, you know, uh, subsequent stories above the basement. Mm -hmm. I question the whole um, uh, approach. Um, I, I don't uh, just because, uh, it, um, you know, the art that gained access to my heart, um, uh, you know, Renaissance art. And when I was a younger kid, probably Norman Rockwell mm. um, didn't seem to have anything to say at all about anything. Um, and yet it was expressive mm. Uh, it was highly expressive. Um, yeah. uh, it seemed to, uh, you know, this art, uh, particularly in the, the, the Renaissance, seemed to, uh, you know, open up um, a, a way, uh, opened up a way of thinking about the world and a way of, f of feeling mm. that once I, um, once I first came across it in art, I then started uh, to recognize so rather than recognizing something about the, the world and then illustrating it in art, uh, I needed art to guide me in, mm. in, in, um, right. in perceiving the world. And right. the art provided the format right. uh, for subsequent perceptions. Um, and so it's the art's ability to guide one's perceptions like that rather than simply reflect one's perceptions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think this division between, you know, baseline skills and content um, uh, gets, gets that energy, gets that truth at the heart of, you know, the poetic arts completely wrong. Um, you know, metaf uh, let's see, foundation, I, I understand the use of that word and er it's, it, it, everybody understands what it means in regards to the art. It's kind of a very clear marker. Yeah. If you have a foundation that you are sort of focusing for the time being as appropriate in the beginning of your education yeah. on sort of, you know, trainable uh, skills. Um, uh, but, you know, foundation is a metaphor and uh, mm -hmm. let's say it's, a, it's an architectural metaphor. It, it sort of um, indicates things that are sturdy. Mm -hmm. and necessary but also things that are buried underneath <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. buried yeah. underground yeah <laughs> and things that get left uh thing uh, something that gets left behind right yeah there is uh a term i would use instead of the foundation uh, but it's also an architectural term and it is from the high renaissance of dependenza mm. Um, and it's uh, roughly the dependence uh between the close interdependence between um uh, uh, between proportion and sensual qualities. Mm. But uh, proportion isn't just measuring things. I think uh, a propor uh, proportion is the cause of your ability to measure things rather than an expression of your ability uh, or the outcome of your ability to, mm. uh, to measure them and um, to have measured them. Mm. So it's this different kind of sturdiness, dependenza, um, which uh, rises along, is a kind of, if it's a foundation, it's a rising foundation. It is yeah. evident in the upper stories of the building. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, is uh, operative in the, in the beauty of the building, in mm -hmm. the sensual qualities. Right, right. So, I don't, I, I, I think that uh, now I'm not going to get anywhere. I mean, this, this is very, very, you know, arcane sort of art historical stuff. It's not going to, it's like to become part of anybody's promotional material. For yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. But it's how I, it's how I regard it, that this dependenza is um, what I have sort of been trying, I've been, been searching for. Mm. It's the animating 
it's the animating spirit and philosophy behind mm. the work that first gained access to my heart. Mm. Um, and uh, it sort of, it's what I'm trying to do uh, in searching for it. I've, I've uh, to the extent I've uh, been able to understand something about it. I have shared that with my, with my students mm. and uh, use it as a force in, you know, work that I make. So um, any school that I would, uh, any school that I would be the head of um, would dispense with this, uh, with the, the distinction between a foundation and then later stories that, mm. that you know, um, kind of leave the foundation literally in the dust. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, now, I think that's wrongheaded. Now, how do you make that practicable, you know, in today's modern, you know, educational profession you have to articulate outcomes you know mm. you have to show measurable progress then i think uh, my system isn't based uh, you know system based on dependenza it's completely it's a different thing i mean i spent uh, you know long uh, years as an administrator of a you know of a an accredited arts program mm. trying to write um, uh, outcomes mm. I'm, I'm not convinced they ever really improved you know, the, the, the education that we were yeah. providing. Yeah. Um, I'm more, you know, I wrote my, my thesis on St. Augustine and St. Augustine's um, a, approach towards, towards learning was based on love, not mm. on some sort of, uh, you know, system of utility yeah. uh, where there is a foundation and then subsequent learning. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, the, so love is what focuses you on your on your subject. Love is what um, motivates you to become closer to your subject and right. to make something positive out of this union. Yeah. And now, religiously, in in Augustine's thinking, you know, you were also motivated to s- search for uh, an image of God in what it was that you love. Now I'm not looking for an image of God in my work um, and nor am I seeking to uh, reveal the image of God in, um, in the substance of my teaching, but mm. it's that quality of searching for something um, that is uh, uh, trustworthy and, right. uh, and, and durable and lasting and meaningful. Yeah. Um, in this, in what you're teaching and how you're, how you're teaching it. Um, and that word dependenza is, um, you know, maybe a slightly different word and a, one that has fewer red flags, uh, around it than the word form. Mm-hmm. But, um, that's, that's the term that I would, uh, I would choose. Um, and so it, uh, of course, uh, you see, then we could do, uh, an independent study based on copying things Mm. because Mm. we wouldn't just be copying them. We would be searching for God. Right. Right. We would uh, be looking for how this particular artist or these group of artists um, incorporated uh, or, you know, enlivened the sense of dependenza, this dependence between cognition um, and and sensual qualities yeah uh you know so you're not just copying something you're searching for something in in copying it and uh and that find the results of that search are new um Mm. they are they are new and so uh, they're new to you um so there's that sense that's uh, essential component of creativity so I have no problem with all the stuff that some of your teachers had a problem with. Mm. I, I think what they had, a, well, I have a problem with what they thought they were having a problem. Right. With, <laughs> uh, that they mis, mis, you know, misunderstood mm. the, you know, what, what was valuable in, in doing something like, like, right, that. Right. um, but, um, 
Yeah, you know, otherwise, if you are just, just sort of copying something, then uh, obviously there are there are drawbacks to that. Yeah. And you're not helping somebody if all you're doing is enabling them to copy something. Yeah, yeah. But that's not what I did when I copied right, uh, right, right. The Bust yeah. of Roma and yeah. the Attic of the Mar- you know, right. the Marble Clue of the Church. Yeah. I was uh, searching for something. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, that, that particular example is a really interesting one to me. I, I, I don't dwell on it. I, I don't have any hard feelings about it. Everything no, turned no, no, out no, fine no. for me, but right. it's a really interesting one because it, it, it occurred to me that as you say, the, the person who, who made that decision just entirely misunderstood what comes out of that kind of activity uh, and, and that, that whatever that, that she had um, associated with that kind of behavior or that kind of learning or whatever um, was, uh, I don't know. I mean, how else can I say it? Like a bit prejudicial, right? Like, like she had some kind of preconceived notion about what we were doing and, and she wasn't willing to, uh, to, to negotiate that with us and to say, well, what are you up to? Why do you want to do this? What's the purpose of that for you? And that we would have been able. Well, yeah, exactly. We were able to articulate that so so easily to her, you know, and uh, and I I think um, you know that was part of the the most interesting thing, and I think that's part of what students really react to when they're going through these college systems, Mm -hmm. is that you know the enthusiasm that we both had for it was like murdered by, by that response, you know, and, uh, and, and that's not good for education, you know, no matter what. So, so there's something really fascinating there. And, and what I'm finding is that, you know, as, as I open myself up to the, the social media world, you know, I know, I know you are as well on Instagram and, and the kind of context and the way in which this stuff works, you, you realize like, man, there's a lot of artists in the world that are, are not in art school, that are not following any kind of traditional path. And even the stuff that we're talking about, like, you know, uh, you know, go to college, go to this, go to that. That's not at all the path that they're taking to find drawing, to find anatomy, uh, right. to find their passion or their God or whatever, you know? Uh, and, and so you know, it, it, there's, there's probably more people making art that aren't doing what we did than that are. Uh, and, and so that's a really interesting, like, kind of um, power thing, right? Which is like, I mean, I'm not saying anything new to say that, like, the status quo is to go to art school, right? Or at least in, mm-hmm. the, in the wealthy sense. And so, you know, there's so many people exploring other options about how to learn. Uh, and, and, you know, calling into question this idea of, of foundation, you know, um, we, I mean, it's something that I, I, you know, I, I, I'm forever stuck on it. You know, I, I, if you ask me one day, I'd swear by it. And you ask me another day, I don't know, you know, I'm really stuck. I, I, I'm not sure about how I feel about it. Um, I, I think I know what it, what it did for me. And I know a place like RISD actually has a really interesting relationship with its foundation program. And I, I, I shouldn't speak for it, but, but if I could bring up a point about it, uh, I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, and it's going to broaden this topic maybe a little bit too far, but, but I think it's an interesting point. One of the things that RISD Foundation does, and it's a, it's a big contrast to many other schools, is that it, it, it takes... Uh, like, like, let me, let me start that over. So as they take in students, right, Mm. they ask those students, well, what do you want to be? You know, we have these majors or these tracks or whatever it is that RISD has now. And, uh, you know, do you want to be a photographer? Do you want to be an illustrator? Do you want to be an animator? What do you want to be? And they tell them and they say, I want to be an animator. I want to be this. I want to be that. Okay. And then they go to foundation year and the number of people that change their mind mm-hmm. high. It's like, I remember that number being over half, like more yep. than half the people that came in ended up like in furniture or in fabric or in whatever, instead of whatever they thought. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a magical thing. And that's something like, it, it, that's not skills building. That's like exposure. You know, that is like eye-opening moments right. in life. Right. 
My uh, yeah, I, you know, I've I, I, the RISD RISD's foundation program. I don't, I don't want to malign foundation. Yeah, yeah. RISD's approach is extremely smart um, mm-hmm. because they uh, foundation is not a service department right. to right. the various major. That's correct. Yeah. It is, um, so, it, it is a sovereign nation over there. <laughs> <I think. laughs> these, these are these are the this is the um, th- this is foundation is what all artists need. Yeah. Um, there is uh, something that uh, there's something that unites all artists, and um, and that's something and uh, isn't necessarily eternal you know it, it it's it seems to be uh you know it's it's a um something that kind of develops and, and changes and yet um uh it is that without which none of the other uh dis- no, no no other disciplinary work can be done artistically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh i you know i think that's the my understanding you went through it but you know my understanding is that's the that's the guiding philosophy to philosophy yeah. to, to the foundation program. And if I had, you know, if, if there were one that was in sync with what, what, with my views, I would say that would, that would be it. Yeah. So it works, right. I think it, it, their concern is that whatever the discipline is, you go off into that it, you, you practice it creatively mm, definitely, yeah. and uh, creatively according to the standards that pertain and the standards that pertain today are perhaps the ones where I would, uh, you know, slightly part company. Mm. I think those standards, the standards today are rooted in an understanding of, um, in, in multidisciplinarity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe that as, as well, but I, you know, have sort of a slightly different, uh, you know, a, a different mm. take, take on yeah. it that, um, interdisciplinarity isn't um doesn't i think it provides less creativity than it's as advertised Mm, yeah well my university where i teach now just signed on to that in a major way it's like the whole philosophy and i i think it's fascinating you know i i I constantly you could ask my students i i don't know if they like it or not i i pretend that they like it but i i only i can only make sports metaphors Force. You know, it's all that I can do is to relate somehow <laughs> arts to sports. But I always think like, you know, OK, you know, if you want to if you want to be at the top of your game, you got to be LeBron James. Well, well, who's asking LeBron James to, you know, uh, uh, run the marketing campaigns also of his team or who's at, you know, it's like he plays basketball. He, he's you know, he does many things. But at the, at the heart of it, he's unidisciplinary. Right? And and. <laughs> And and when he becomes interdisciplinary, he teams up with or he collaborates with. And collaboration is a different thing than being interdisciplinary because interdisciplinary divides your time. Collaboration means that you take your discipline and you team up. And th- these concepts, like, you know, uh, they're, they're missing from that conversation, that distinction. And as I said, like, I, I believe, and, and at least it's true for me in my practice, like fitness matters. And so, you know, for, if you go back to the LeBron James example, you know, what does he do during the off season? Well, he trains the whole time. Mm-hmm. And, and so for, for either a student or for instance, for, a, you know, for someone like myself, uh, you know, it, I'm being asked to, change disciplines in the off season, you know, okay, you're a basketball player now be a car salesman, you know, during the off season. And that's not how you get in shape. Right. (laughs) Or, you know, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I I went to graduate school with a great artist, um, but nobody knew it at the time because he was incognito. Owen Land, um, Mm -hmm. George uh, was a sort of a a, kind of a pseudo acronym for George Landa. Mm -hmm who is an avant-garde filmmaker mm. and a great one. Uh, I, I mean, a, 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 a genius. And he was the guy in my class who um, you know, kept to himself, 
uh, was uh, didn't, didn't have very many uh, evident uh, social skills. Seemed very serious. Mm. Uh, looked like Vincent Van Gogh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and seemed to have a vision, but was was uh, uh, really unable to to put flesh on the on the bones. Mm. Uh, I remember his final work was uh, sort of a dramatic, uh, sort of two toned painting. Um, uh, very uh, chiaroscuro mm. uh, in its contrast. Uh, it was a, a mountaintop with a figure I seem to be gesturing. Mm. So he, he had gone in incognito. Um, uh, I think to, uh, on a hunch, sort of a, an intuition that this, mm. that, his, that painting and learning about painting would, um, you know, would advance his art. Mm. Um, I hope it, it did, but it didn't advance painting. Mm-hmm. Um, because he, he wasn't a, he wasn't a painter, um, and so I think it's it's not true that uh, everything a creative person touches <laughs> turns off. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I, I, I think uh, you know you, you are a dis, you work in a discipline yeah. um, first, and you are rooted in a discipline. Mm. Uh, and I think you become, you are expressive in, in that discipline. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, ever since sort of, uh, at some point, you know, um, it was, this, this came out much later that we were, that this, this guy who could, couldn't seem to gain traction as a, as a painter in, mm. in, in my, in my class was actually yeah. a great artist, but just yeah. in another, another art form just drove home to me the fact that, well, you know, there's the, these are real, these mm. distinctions between mm. art forms. Right. Right. Um, the other thing I want to mention in the score is, is, is um, uh, life drawing or figure drawing. Mm. It's uh, something I practice is, is perhaps the very model of a unidisciplinary form. Mm. Uh, you know, it is, if, you know, if, if, it is in its own lane artistically. Mm. It is its own discipline. Um, except that it turns out that it was practiced most poetically by interdisciplinary artists, mm. artists who were sculptors and architects. Mm. And uh, going back to this notion of dependenza, mm. it's an architectural term that was imported from architecture into Michelangelo's approach to, to life drawing. And um, that approach was not based on copying the figure as it you know, presented itself uh, directly before, right. before Michelangelo, before the artist, but was based on a kind of architectural um, floor plan mm-hmm. where different stages, uh, different parts of the figure were constructed as though from a bird's eye view Mm-hmm. with um, the uh, different components of the figure, um, each corresponding to its own axis. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, as the results are figures that on the page that were never directly before the artist in, in observation, but mm-hmm. they were sort of, I think of them as architectural constructions and they're also in another sense, dramatizations. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what, what, their their life derives from their interdisciplinarity uh, uh, with architecture, um, and yet we now um, tend to misunderstand them as disciplinary. Right. So I think that the 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 multidisciplinarity depends on where where it's feeding into your art. I mean, it it sh- it should be something that you. Uh, tap into because you've dug down deeper into your discipline mm. rather than made a lateral move, right, right. At, right. you know, at a very early, early stage right. um, to, to another, another discipline. I think that, um, you know, I, 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 I'm in sync with, with RISD and it's in its approach that there is something at the root here, something, something that um, uh, needs that, that interdisciplinarity is, is at the root, but um, I'm, maybe it's my example may hopefully illustrates. I think that uh, you, you find your way to other disciplines by digging deeper into, into your own mm. and taking a critical approach to your, your own discipline. So 
Yeah, you know, also because when I, uh, again, at the in, in the attic of the mar- in, at that church, uh, I felt like I, I wasn't doing anything foundational. I was going right for the thing. I was mm. going right for it. Right, you know, right, right. I, I someone put a you know piece of charcoal in my hand and mm. said, "Okay, we're we're going to do the very thing you're 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 after. We're we're not going to like right. take it in ages." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, That's you know, such you, an important distinction, isn't it? Like the, this idea that um, that right away you should be pushing as right far as you can possibly push with only the highest standard in mind, which is to make something excellent. And I, 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 I do find that, um, you know, the, the, the refuge, is that the right word? Like the, the, the ability to call yourself a student is the, the ability to relieve yourself of the responsibility of being fully formed. And so there, there's the idea, okay, we're all lifetime learners. Like I'm a lifetime learner. You're a lifetime learner, right? We're still, you know, we're still studying anatomy. We're still struggling with anatomy. Um, you know, n- neither of us would be so um, uh, out- outrageous to just be like, we're anatomy masters, finished. You know, like, like I mean, you know, that's not, uh, that's not really in my, in my bones to, to make a claim like that or even to feel like that. Um, but, you know, I haven't felt like a student since I was in high school. Um so there's a weird distinction there, you know, uh, that, that I find that some of my students are, are just stuck in that student gear and they really do. They make a distinction like, Oh, you know, when you're asking me to do this, that's for people like them, you know, I'm not there yet. I can't do that. And, and I never understand that mentality. I mean, I guess in some ways I was just lucky that I didn't share it. Um, Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, for me, and, and, you know, I told you the story of having people like Nick Uribe or James Jean in school with you. And, and those people are just, you know, the perfect exemplar of like, oh, man, these guys can do it. You know, <laughs> like they're really doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people like Farrell, I mentioned him as well. You know, mm-hmm. he was publishing comics in school and they were yeah. good. You know, like he would like he would like you'd give them a dollar and you'd take it and you'd read it and you'd be like, Oh, you're a, you're a comics artist. Like what, you know, you're, you're it, you know, you're still in school, but you're, you're a comics artist. And so that example was really profound to me. Uh, And I feel, I I think it, 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 I I hope that it's echoing. I mean, that's how I'm understanding what you're saying, which was like, when you're in that attic, it it was at that moment, it it was the glory of the thing, you know, and, and maybe you, you look back at those drawings and and you could have improved or not or whatever, but that's not the point. Uh, The point is that, that, that the pursuit of the thing was glorious in and of itself and that nothing would, nothing could interrupt that pursuit uh, because it mattered. Mm -hmm. And it, and the thing that you intend to make must exist. And that kind of like, that's the kind of audacity that I, I always had, which was that, you know, and I find myself lucky for this, that the thing that I imagined that I'll, the thing that I imagined that I'll make must exist. That's how I feel like world's a better place for it. You know, something like that. I don't know how, I don't know how much is a better place it is, but I better make it. It it seems important. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, you know, I think that uh, if if you've come to art, you um, you are in some sense an uh, an ambitious person, um, right? Yeah, uh, and uh, there's something inside, and um, <clears throat> uh, and um, I think if you're a if you're a if you're a teacher, um, mindful of that. Uh, you want to provide, uh, right? Some you want to provide the, the means f- for for that that expression, um, and as you know, and and just to 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 go for go for that very thing on the very first day of class. <laughs> Right, and right, I think yeah. it's I think it's possible. I mean, I, I think there are, there are things that uh, that students can learn to do 
fairly quickly insights that uh, into seeing um, into seeing things uh, and 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 to be able to see them themselves. I think this it's, it's, it happens it happens quickly, but. Um, yeah, uh, I, maybe uh, maybe it is easier. Uh, maybe the medium has something to do with it. You know, if it's if it's uh, you know drawing is is, is quite quite straightforward. You, you don't have a, a lot of technical hurdles right. to overcome, as opposed to like sculpture or something like this. Print, printmaking or you right, know sculpture right, or right. even oil painting, right? So yeah. the, you know the way that's the oil paint handles, and I, I actually sort of always kind of. Sort of shied away maybe my, my because i was a little in it i think i was i was always intimidated by solvents mm. so <laughs> sort of cross off painting sure. and, uh, yeah. uh even printmaking um yeah. and uh you know uh, sculpture is like an industry um, <laughs> okay. somebody so told me you were a sculptor once is that true yeah no i sculpted a lot uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I miss and um i would do i would do more more of it yeah. but um I just am wondering the extent to which my philosophy is just a philosophy of sort of justifying staying away from things that require a, a lot of um, uh. <laughs> tech, uh, overcoming a lot of technical hurdles, uh, right? Because you just, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, pull, pull a, you know, you roast a hot dog in the fire and, you know, char it up and then there's your drawing utensil, right? That's, right, yeah. <laughs> Delicious drawing utensil. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, nothing could be simpler. <laughs> um, so, you know, like what, yeah, maybe that's, you know, what's the simplest possible means and the, the biggest, for the biggest possible artistic impact. Right, right. Maybe that's drawing. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a lovely note to end on, I think. Uh, well, yeah, no, you have uh, you have many fabulous uh, and interesting in uh, conversations ahead of you in this in this series. So I look forward to hearing those. But uh, I've had, uh, yeah, it's, well, as always, it's uh, fun to talk with you, yeah. Jesse. Yeah, thank you so much, Randy, and uh, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs>